Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate Day 668, Saturday, January 19th, 2019. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode, another commercial free episode by the way, of Towergate. No, no commercials, never, never ever, never been a single commercial, 668 videos, no commercials, never will be, never has been, not going to happen. Wow, another day of massive news. Three days in a row. No way I can get to it all again. Great comments in the comments section though over the last two or three days. Been real busy with some stuff going on at work. Haven't been able to comment on as many as I'd like. But uh, I'm, reading, I'm reading them. Continue the great comments. I get to them when I can. A lot of times I do get to read through the comments. I just don't have time to respond to all of them. But uh, continue on. Well, let's go ahead and get started right here incredible article by Molly Hemingway at The Federalist, one of my favorite writers and one of my favorite sites, by the way. Uh, her and Margot Cleveland are excellent. Uh, I don't know if they are lawyers, if they have a legal background or something, but they, they do a lot of le legal type reporting. And I don't know if she's gotten new information talking about Molly Hemingway or if she has maybe received some leaks or if she is working from sources or if she is just commenting on things she's extracted from the recent releases uh, uh, to Jeff Carlson or, or what, I don't know, John Solomon, I don't know where she's getting her information, but it's a good article, but, uh, I, and I don't have time to go through it all, but I, I just want to summarize the most important point that she brings up in this article, Molly Hemingway, The Federalist. <clears throat> so here's the bottom line of this story. It's pretty much this. Bruce, that would be Bruce, or says that he repeatedly and specifically told top officials at the FBI and DOJ about the dossier author Christopher Steele, his bias, and his employer, Fusion GPS's, conflicts of interest and the information that they kept hidden from the FISA court. These conversations involved high-level officials, including some who are now senior officials in the special counsel probe. And the conversations begin taking place in the earliest days of August 2016, much earlier than previously revealed to congressional investigators seeking to learn the facts about the FBI's decision to spy on the Trump campaign. What's important right here is the date. We've been led again to believe that all of this information, and this came from various sources, including the bug-eyed fool Adam Schiff, that all this stuff happened after the original uh, Carter Page FISA warrant. Here, we are learning that this stuff happened almost two months before the Carter Page FISA application. Bruce Orr had been briefing people at the FBI, the DOJ, top-level people at the FBI and DOJ in early August, two months before the FISA, the first FISA on Carter Page. Including, specifically, Bruce Orr telling them that, yeah, Christopher Steele's totally biased, man. He hates the president. Yeah, Glenn Simpson, who I've been talking to, totally biased. And my wife, by the way, is working for them. They hate the president. All this information was given to top officials at the FBI and DOJ in early August, almost two months before the Carter Page FISA warrant, and not a single effing word of it was in the application to the FISA court to get the FISA warrant on Carter Page. Not a single bit of it. Which is a violation of the Woods Act and just the general application for a FISA warrant. 
all completely left out of the application on the FISA. Of course, this was after Christopher Steele was terminated as a source by the FBI. So what makes this all even worse is that Bruce Orr is getting this information from Glenn Simpson and from Christopher Steele, who had been terminated by the FBI. But then it appears that Peter's been stroking us, went to this FBI agent, Joe Pienka, and said, okay, you're going to be my middleman uh, between myself and Bruce Orr despite the fact that Bruce Orr also admits to briefing in person on several occasions, multiple occasions actually, Peter has been stroking us himself along with Lisa Page and other FBI DOJ officials. But for these meetings that were taking place outside of the Department of Justice, taking place in some restaurant or some park or something that Bruce Orr was having with Christopher Steele and Glenn Simpson, but specifically in this case, Christopher Steele, Christopher Steele had been fired as a source. So Peter's been stroking and says, okay, well, gee, we officially can't use him as a source anymore, so we fired him. So we're just going to go ahead and have him um, work between this FBI agent with Bruce Orr, who's the, you know, number four man at the DOJ. We're going to have him meet with Orr. Orr is going to feed the stuff to uh, this middleman FBI agent, Pienka, and then back into the flow. <laughs> so essentially, uh, Peter's been stroking us, made uh, Joe Pienka sort of a handler of Bruce Orr, uh, to gather the information from Bruce Orr, and then it would be passed along to Peter's been stroking us and Luce Lisa Page, who then would communicate that to uh, McCabe, and on and on. And they all knew. They all knew. Or also gave critical information about the source, Steele, that did not appear in the FISA application that should have. He also personally, Bruce Orr, personally briefed Andy McCabe on or about July the 30th, 2016, the day before they launched Operation Crossfire Hurricane. Then, just a couple days later, he briefed two other DOJ officials who are now on the Mueller team. He met with Lisa Page shortly after that, meaning shortly after that July 30th, 2016 date. So the FBI and DOJ knew almost two months before getting the FISA warrant on Carter Page of Orr's relationship with Steele and Glenn Simpson he, they knew of Steele's bias against Donald Trump. They knew that Nellie Orr, Bruce Orr's wife, was working for them and was being compensated for her work by Fusion GPS and Glenn Simpson and that they were both working for, in some way, the Clinton campaign. Not a single word of this in the FISA application. There's no way, there is no way that Barr, soon to be the Attorney General, Barr, can read this story by Molly Hemingway and then gather the documents to verify it and not take action, serious action, because this is major crime here. You want to talk about obstruction? This is obstruction, abuse of power, uh, and probably a, a dozen other, other uh, second tier, third tier felonies associated with what they did. Withholding uh, uh, this evidence from the FISA court, uh, lying to a FISA judge, uh, lying on a FISA application, abuse of power, obstruction, uh, um, there's evidence related uh, crimes here, uh, withholding evidence type crimes. There is uh, uh, deception crimes. There are um, 
on the civil side, these are what these would these would be civil rights violations, civil violations against all the players who were harmed in the effort, which would have been Carter Page, George uh, uh, Papagalopoulos, uh, Michael Flynn, and anyone who was affected by a FISA warrant where this type of chicanery took place, this type of illegal activity. These are civil rights violations against these individuals. So we have civil, we have uh, civil issues, we have criminal issues, it, just beyond imagination here. Uh, and we're talking about dozens of high level people. And this, the only question here that Barr has to be, uh, get to the bottom of, besides verifying what Molly Hemingway has wrote here and what we just read from um, John Solomon and what we just read from uh, uh, these last three leaks, um, the only thing he has to determine is high, how, how, how high did this go? Did it stop at McCabe? Did it stop with McCabe? Or did it go to Comey? Did it go to Loretta Lynch? Sally Yates? Obama? Ben Rhodes? And how much of this was known to the rotten Reverend Clinton? How much was her guiding hand involved in all these events? These are the only questions that Barr needs to investigate and answer. And when he does, he will have no choice. He will have no choice. There's no gray area here. This is not even close. So people ask me sometimes in the comments section why I continue to do this and do I get frustrated. Yes, I do get frustrated. Been doing this for a long time. On this story now for a long time. I have good days and bad days. I get frustrated. But I've always believed from day one, just as I've told you many times, and the reason I continue to do these videos, is that I believe that this crime is too big to cover up. You cannot cover up something like this. There is too much, there's too much of a trail of evidence. There is a paper trail of evidence. All of what I'm telling you is backed up by either witness testimony, in this case, Bruce Orr, as well as documents. And we have the actual FISA applications. We know that the spying occurred. We know when it occurred. We know how it occurred. And we know pretty much most of the players involved. And every bit of the dossier that's relevant, that would be criminal, has been either not proven to be true or proven to be false. <clears throat> this is the biggest political scandal, <clears throat> the biggest political crime since the JFK assassination. <clears throat> the biggest cover-up, certainly since uh, Watergate and the JFK assassination. This rivals both of those. It's, it's actually much bigger than Watergate. I don't know if I can say it's bigger than the Kennedy assassination, but it's, it's getting pretty close. People say, when, when, where's the smoking gun? When are they going to have the smoking gun? If the media was doing their effing job, <clears throat> this thing would have been sewn up a long time ago. All these people would already be in jail. Many of them are going to jail. I've said it many times, and I'm absolutely convinced of it now. There's no way the new Attorney General, Barr, once confirmed, having already told Lindsey Graham he would investigate the FISA, he would investigate the, these things, the Spygate things, he reads the papers. He follows this story. We already know because of comments he's made. He's reading this story today in The Federalist, I assure you of that. Mr. Barr. He probably read Solomon's story two days ago. He's probably read the information from um, Jeff Carlson from the three testimonies or Page and Papalopoulos, Papagalopoulos. He's probably read all that too. And he's got friends at the DOJ and the FBI. He's got inside sources. William Barr is probably a 
very conflicted man right now. He knows, you know, he knows what he must do. If he wasn't prepared to do it, I think he probably would have walked away from the job. Probably said, man, I'd love to be attorney general, but now's not the time. Not for me. I'm too involved in this. I have a lot of information about what's all been going on. I have too much of an opinion of it. I don't know if I could be unbiased. I don't know if I could do it. Because what I see is outrageous. <clears throat> he told Lindsey Graham he was sickened by what he saw in the page and struck texts. He must feel that he can investigate this, apply equal justice under the law, uh, and still somehow uh, be able to to be around these people who he claims are people he knows and likes, are friends, Uncle Bob, Rodenstein, Comey. He knows all these guys and says they're friendly. He says they're, they're good guys. He's got to be. He can't have it both ways here. He's reading this information. When he gets in there and starts investigating this, what do he finds out? What happens when he finds out Mueller's not a good guy and is running a witch hunt? What happens when he finds out Rodenstein's not a straight player? What happens when he finds out that Comey is a dirtbag? Did he say those things in his hearings just to get through the, the confirmation, knowing good and well, as soon as he gets him in his appointed, that he's going to begin the takedown? Because he, he could not survive this. Mr. Barr cannot be in his position as Attorney General having all this coming to light and not act. He doesn't have any choice here. This is not an option. <laughs> you cannot learn what I just told you as Attorney General and go, eh, yeah, they did some things they shouldn't have done, but, you know, eh, it's just an election, you know, these things happen. No, these are, these are very, very, very serious crimes. Many, many crimes. And I don't think the President is, uh, is uh, going to let it uh, slide. I doubt that he directly asked Barr if he's going to prosecute these criminals, and I doubt that Barr looked Trump in the eye and said, if you nominate me as Attorney General, I'll take down the deep state. I don't think that conversation happened, but there must be some sort of a warm, fuzzy feeling that both of them had about their uh, conversation they had in the Oval Office about how to move forward and deal with this issue. And it's a big issue, and somebody's got to deal with it. And Mr. Barr and President Trump are the two guys. Uh, I'm telling you, friends, uh, you, 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 no, you can't have this. This, you know, you, you can't have this be public knowledge. You can't have evidence that proves what I just told you, what Molly Hemway wrote in her story, what we got from John Solomon in the, in the story two days ago. You can't have those kind of facts with evidence to back them and not act. It's not possible. <clears throat> Joe DeGeneva and Victoria Tensing were on Lou Dobbs. I don't know if they know Mr. Barr or not, but they both said they are 100% sure that Barr is a straight shooter, will get to the bottom of it, he will administer equal justice under the law. Uh, DeGeneva and Tensing do believe that Barr is going to act. And I believe he will too, to this extent, that not because I think he, you know, is, is necessarily a Trump supporter or, you know, or whatever, or is opposed to the deep state. He comes from the deep state. I just think he has no choice. You cannot have this much evidence of these kinds of crimes and not prosecute them. It's just, you can't do it. It's, it's not possible. Because as we've been following this story, as most of you know who watch these videos every day, this stuff comes out drip, 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 drip. It's been happening now for 600 and what, how many videos? 600 and God knows how many videos. I've lost track, but it's a lot of videos, 668 videos of drip, 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 drip. And here we are. And now about just about most of the whole story is out. We just about know about 98% of what happened and who was involved, what they did. And now it's not just speculation or rumor, facts, evidence.
Facts and evidence. Facts and evidence. Can't be ignored. So two days ago, I reported on this story about this Russian prostitute who was apparently working for uh, Oleg Deripaska. Uh, uh, she was teaching classes in Thailand on how to, teaching women on how to use their sexuality to attract billionaires, like she attracted Mr. Deripaska. <laughs> And um, it all at the time all this is going on, it was all during the 2016-2017 period. It's in question. Then she gets locked up and arrested in Thailand. And to, as a ploy, we thought, to try to get out of jail, she said that she had some sort of tape or some sort of information uh, about Trump-Russia collusion. And CNN and a couple other news networks actually went over and tried to interview her. So then we hear the other day that... Um, suddenly, they've uh, released her um, and let her out early, out of jail, early, along with the other woman who was working with her. First, my question, my first question is, why didn't Deripaska bail his girl out of jail? He's left a rotten jail for nine months. Maybe he wanted her to stay there. She can't cause him any trouble when she's in jail. The people in Thailand wouldn't allow the reporters to actually interview her, I don't believe. They did go there and ask a lot of questions, but I don't think they ever got a personal interview with her. She was able, I think, to make some statements, but I don't think directly to reporters in the interviews. And she said that she had some information on Trump-Russia collusion. So this is all going on in the background, 2016-2017. So then we hear two days ago that she gets her sentence you know, reduced or whatever, and they let her out. So it turns out now, and her real name is actually Anastasia Vash, uh, Vash, Vashukovich. Anastasia Vashukovich. She's a former Rus Russian prostitute. So she gets off the plane as she gets back. She's not going to be, her final destination was not Moscow, but she, uh, she had a connecting flight through Moscow. But when she got to Moscow, her flight landed, Russian police arrested her and charged her with prostitution and now they're holding her in Russia why so the rumor was is that someone on Mueller's team Uncle Bob the executioner's team or someone went over and did something to try to get her released early so they could get I guess to her access to her or to her tape or whatever information she has and her final destination was not Russia it was somewhere else I think Belarus where I think she's actually from but, it, but, but the cops in Moscow arrest her. So, obviously, Olaf Deripaska is a billionaire. <laughs> you don't think he could have gotten her out of jail in Thailand? Come on, man. He could have, he could have passed $100,000 or probably less than that to some official in Thailand and had her out of jail in 10 minutes. But he never did. Why would the Russians... Why would the Russians arrest her for prostitution? They don't give a damn. There's prostitutes all over Moscow. They don't care. They brag about the fact that they have the best prostitutes in the world. I don't know. I've never been to Russia. I've never been with a prostitute. But Putin says they have some damn good prostitutes, the best, the best you can find. It's common. Prostitution in Russia is common. Why would they bust her for prostitution? They want her on ice. They don't want her talking to somebody. They want to keep her out of somebody's hands. Maybe Deripaska found out that someone got her out and he called someone in Moscow and said, hey, you know, you really don't want her talking. You really don't want her talking. I definitely don't want her talking. She's got information, that's, you know, whatever. So I don't know if Deripaska called someone in Russia and said, hey, man, somebody just, uh, you know, sprung her. You might want to pick her up. She could cause a problem for you and me and other people, whatever. For some reason, there's something going on here. I don't know exactly what. I don't believe that she has a videotape or anything like that. But she would have been around Deripaska the whole time in 2016. Remember, in 2016, the FBI went to Deripaska a couple times, tried to get him to participate in the coup. He laughed at them when they said, yeah, we think Trump's involved in some uh, uh, Trump-Russia collusion. He laughed at them and said, that's crazy. No, I'm not going to work for you. That's stupid. I'm not going to get involved in all this. 
but then we find out that he may have been a source for um, he may have been a source for for the dossier to Christopher Steele. Then we find out he's being represented by the same lawyer, Mr. Waldman, who's representing Steele. You know, there's a lot of things going on here, folks. A lot of moving parts. There's something going on here with her. I don't know that she's got a tape, but certainly Derek Posca likes to talk a lot. She was, he was around her a lot. They were together a lot. There's pictures of him on his yacht. He was working this little business, setting up this little business for uh, Derek Posca, recruiting women for this little school where you teach them how to pick up Russian oligarchs. He was probably a joke that they were joking about, and they said, hey, let's do it. Let's go to Thailand to do it. For some reason, they want to keep her quiet. Maybe she knows that, maybe she knows the role that certain people were playing working with the FBI or the deep state. She must have information damaging to Deripaska. That's my, that's my gut feeling. And what's Deripaska? He's a businessman. He uses this kind of stuff as leverage to be able to get a visa into the United States where he's been barred. Uh, to get other things done. I mean, just think about it. If you've got this kind of information and you're Deripaska, you've essentially got blackmail material on the U.S. government, the FBI, and the Mueller team. And she could screw it all up. There's a lot to uh, look at here. Trump will be making an announcement at 3 o'clock today, Saturday on border security and the government shutdown. <laughs> just as he's making, just as this hit the, hit the, the airwaves, the, the public wires and the newspapers and the blog sites and everything else, just as we learned that Trump's going to make this 3 o'clock p.m. Saturday um, announcement <clears throat> on border, border security and the government shutdown, we get another story showing that Nancy Pelosi uh, being caught on camera at Reagan International Airport heading out of town. Now, is she going back to San Francisco, back home, to her walled mansion? Or is she going on her foreign trip? No one really knows. But Trump's going to catch her ass out of town. What if he catches her ass out of town tomorrow, or today, Saturday at 3 o'clock, and announces that he's going to use, that he's found the money for the wall, that he's found the money from some other place? And then he's going to end the government shutdown, and he needs Nancy. He needs Nancy to come back and put the bill up on the floor that reopens the government. He doesn't need the wall funding in the bill anymore because he's already got it somewhere else. But he needs her to come back so they can open the government. Oh, how pissed would she be? And of course, this big story that was going around the internet today, just crazy, uh, not just the internet, but all over the uh, mainstream uh, uh, corporate uh, left-wing fake news about, um, about uh, Michael Cohen. Supposedly, it was a story that Uncle Bob, the special counsel, had evidence that, uh, that uh, Trump told Cohen to lie to Congress about this, you know, Trump Tower that they were going to build in Russia. And I cannot believe how many stupid, crazy uh, Trump derangement syndrome nutcase media people fell for it. They spent the entire day on this story. It was so bad that Uncle Bob the Executioner, his office had to come out and issue a statement saying that the BuzzFeed story is untrue. That Michael Cohen has not admitted to anyone in the special counsel's investigation that Trump told him to lie to Congress about the Trump Tower project in Moscow. It's not true. <laughs> Blew the whole story up ruined their day. But what's amazing is that they have these crazy people on CNN and MSNBC who claim to be attorneys. You know, uh, political experts, uh, U.S. law experts, constitutional experts, all these experts go on CNN, MSNBC, former politicians, all these people, and talk about this all damn day long. When a complete idiot, a complete idiot, in about 15 minutes could think this through and go, wait a minute, what's wrong with this story? It can't be possible. It possibly can't be true. I'll give you two reasons why. And it was BuzzFeed, of course, who published it. Why anyone believes anything that comes out of BuzzFeed is beyond me. Number one, why would anyone, let alone Trump or any president or anyone with a half a brain, an IQ over 70, why would anyone tell someone to lie to Congress about something that was not a crime? 
Why would you tell someone to lie about something that's not a crime? You wouldn't, unless you were crazy, stupid. And Trump's not crazy or stupid. He would certainly never say, yeah, that Trump Tower project, go ahead and uh, tell him it wouldn't happen or when it was happening, it wasn't really happening, it was a different time. Well, just lie to him. Right. There was nothing at all wrong with Trump looking at the possibility of building a Trump Tower in Moscow. They had a few meetings, they looked at it, decided not to do it. There was nothing ever illegal about it. Nothing to lie about, nothing to cover up. And it all happened before uh, he even... Uh, uh, before he won the nomination. And once he won the nomination, he said even if he had that project, uh, it, had he won the nomination, he said he probably would have uh, put it on hold or would have killed the deal, wouldn't have gone through with it. But still, nobody in their right mind would order somebody to lie to Congress about something that is not a crime. And another reason why you should know that the story was false in the beginning is if Uncle Bob had Michael Cohen admitting, and he had other evidence to support, that Trump told Cohen to lie to Congress about anything, regardless of what it was, why would he not have charged Cohen? Cohen's already been charged. He's done. He's going to jail for three years. And one of the things he's being li char charged with, lying to Congress. So what are the Democrats going to do? Bring him into Congress as a, as a, as a, as a witness. <laughs> oh, God. And the Democrats think that we got him now. We got him now. I'm telling you, my friends, Trump derangement syndrome, it must have some uh, uh, effect of literally wearing down or, or dumbing people down, making them stupid. That's what Trump derangement syndrome is. It's a disease that when you get it, it makes you go stupid. Because these people are literally all over TV. They're supposed to be professionals, lawyers, constitutional experts, political you know, experts. They can't sort this out in 15 minutes? That this can't possibly be true? They're going to report on it and then talk about it all day and get people slobbering all, all over themselves? This is it for Trump. Yep, this is it. Yeah, he's done. Yeah, they, oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, this is not just impeachment or removed from office. He's going to prison. It's criminal indictment. Huh? Are you fucking kidding me? Trump derangement syndrome makes people stupid. Unbelievable. The Women's March is dissolving, essentially. There are now so much infighting in the Women's March. Even Debbie Blabbermouth Wasserman Schultz has come out, like a lot of other Jewish women, and said that the, they are peddlers of hate. And another thing, they're getting rid of the pink pussy hats. Now, the pink pussy hats, which was the symbol of their entire movement, is now, to many people inside the movement, not a good thing to have. It, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not politically correct for the movement. So no more pink pussy hats. That was the only thing about it I liked. Then we have this idiot Pelosi doing this little presser, and she says that Trump put her life in danger. Put her life in danger. Because he outed the fact that they were going to Afghanistan uh, on a commercial flight. They weren't going to go take a commercial flight to Afghanistan. Who the fuck flies to Afghanistan? Does Southwest Air fly to Afghanistan? Does U.S. Air? Does a Delta? Do you know anybody that flies direct to Afghanistan? Well, they do. And, and, they, and they made them arrangements that quickly? They weren't going to go to Afghanistan? Pay for it themselves? Are you kidding me? She's a nut. And just to prove she's a nut, how about this little statement she made in another presser right after that? She wants electronic dogs to protect the border. Electronic dogs to protect the border. No, I say bring back the pink pussy hats, send those three or four million crazy ass women down to the border and just put them down on the border and feed them every now and then. That'll scare the hell out of anybody. The caravan will turn around the other way and run the other way as fast as they can. When they see 3,000 crazy women and three million crazy women in pink pussy hats screaming at the sky. <laughs> Trump has a new promotion on his website to send 100,000 bricks to Pelosi and Schumer's office to prove that walls work. It's $20.20 per brick. Make sure you send a brick today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. See you. Bye.